All right, turn with me to Matthew 9. Uh, We left off last time with Matthew being called from being a tax collector to follow Jesus. And immediately we saw Matthew leaves his tax collecting business behind And he follows Jesus. Remember, Matthew, the tax collector, is the one who wrote this gospel according to Matthew. As we also saw last time, tax collectors were hated by the Jewish people. They saw tax collectors as traitors. And the reason they looked at them as traitors was because they were Jewish men that were working for the Roman Empire. And they were collecting taxes from the Jewish people and they were ripping off the Jewish people. And they grew rich by taxing the people above and beyond what the Roman government required. So they could collect what the Romans said, we need this, they would collect it. Anything above and beyond that, the tax collectors would keep. And again, they grew rich off of this. For the most part, tax collectors had turned their back on the Jewish faith. Uh, It's in Matthew's gospel. He gives us some reasons why, and he hints at why he and other tax collectors turn their back on the Jewish faith. Um, He uses the word hypocrites, hypocrisy, more than any other of the New Testament books combined. Sixteen times, Matthew quotes Jesus as calling the religious leaders hypocrites. This tells us that Matthew saw the religious hypocrisy of the so-called religious leaders in Israel, and no doubt it was everywhere, from the high priest all the way down, from Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, which there's only supposed to be one at a time, but this time because of um, incorruption, corruption, they were two high priests, father-in-law and his son-in-law, and all the way down through the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were all getting rich off the Lord's flock of people. This is why Jesus calls them out as hypocrites so many times in this gospel. But in spite of all the religious hypocrisy around him, it doesn't keep Matthew from following after Jesus. I mean, he knew he was a broken man. He knew that his life was a mess. And that's important to keep in mind when you and I talk to other people about Jesus because religious hypocrisy is one of the biggest reasons why people don't want to come to Christ. You know, they look at Christians, they look at religion as a bunch of hypocrisy and a bunch of hypocrites. And I understand that because religion is one of the biggest enemies of the gospel of Christ. That's because the gospel of Christ When we believe in Jesus, we put our faith and trust in Him alone for our salvation. We are brought into a relationship with Christ. Religion can't do that for you, but Jesus certainly can. Religion is man's attempt to appease God and try to come to Him by our own efforts. It's impossible. This is why so many corrupt people use religion to coerce, manipulate, bargain with others, trying to bring them into their religious system. Now remember, the Greek word for hypocrite is hupokrites, which means a person who wears a mask. And that's exactly what these religious leaders were. They were hypocrites. They were wearing a mask. They wanted everybody to think Everything was great and wonderful, and they were so righteous and all these other things, and yet they were miserable, they were poor, they were blind, they were naked, you know, from God's perspective. They put on a mask to try to pretend that everything in their life was great when really they were discouraged, they were desperate, they were broken, and that's how Matthew was. And so people that are wearing a mask, they're too... Um, afraid to you know, take off the mask. They don't want people to see them as they really are. But when a person comes into a relationship with God through Christ, they become a new creation in Christ. The, the mask is removed. You know God sees you. He sees everything in your life. He knows all about you, and He loves you anyway. Isn't that amazing? No matter what we've done, no matter who we've been, no matter what we're doing, God loves us, and He sent Jesus to pay the price for our sins. So He makes that impression upon our hearts and our minds that outweighs anything we could ever get from being religious. And so when Jesus walked by Matthew, as we saw last time, from Matthew's perspective, it says 
when Jesus walked by him, it says, and Jesus saw a man. In the other Gospels, when Jesus came to Matthew, Mark, and Luke say, oh, he saw a tax collector. He saw traitors, what they're saying. No, when Jesus walked by Matthew, Matthew saw, uh, he looked at him as a man, a man who was desperate, a man who was hurting, a man who was not a traitor or a thief, but a broken, hurting human being who was turned off by all the religious hypocrisy that was all around him. So as soon as Jesus said, follow me, instantly he leaves his tax collecting business behind. And again, that meant he had a lot of wealth, but he left that old life behind and he quickly experienced new life in Christ. We saw that Matthew then invites all of his fellow tax collectors and other sinners, it says, to this banquet, and he's bringing in all these people to meet Jesus because he was so excited about the new life he had, he had to let others know. And so he introduces Jesus to all these other hurting people. So now we pick up in chapter 9, verse 14, and we have a different scene before us. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast often? But your disciples do not fast. These are the disciples of John the Baptist. And so they ask two questions. Jesus only answers the second question. You know, they ask him, so why do we and the Pharisees fast often? Well, if you don't know why you're doing it, why are you asking me? You know, that's the bottom line here. You're just going along with the crowd. You don't even know why you're fasting, but you're fasting often. And they didn't even know why. But again, that's what religion does. You don't know what you're doing. You just kind of go along with the crowd, doing what everybody else is doing. And I, I know some of you, you grew up in very formal uh, churches that had a lot of rules, rituals, regulations. You went through a lot of religious stuff. And you don't even know why you did it. It was just because everybody was doing it. So yeah, we do this, kneel there, and do all these things. And you don't know why. You just did it. So here's the the disciples of John the Baptist. They want to know why they and the Pharisees fasted often. Jesus already told us why the Pharisees were fasting often. He told us back in chapter 6, verse 16, they were doing it because they wanted to be seen by men. They wanted people to look at them and say, oh, look how righteous these Pharisees are. And the Pharisees were fasting twice a week. So God only required one fast from the Jews. There's only one that he said, this is the day, one day out of the year you fast. It was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. So the Pharisees added 104 more fasts to that. Again, twice a week, and they're fasting, but they probably were cheating here and there. But they'd put on makeup, and they'd stand before the people on the you know, street corners, look at me, I'm just so spiritual. Look how much I'm suffering for God. And Jesus calls them out as a bunch of hypocrites back in chapter 6, 16. Anyway, they did it to be seen by men. They were self-righteous. They were not righteous at all. The reality is when it comes to fasting, you can fast as much or as little as you want. It doesn't really matter. The important thing is when you fast, make sure you are seeking the Lord at that time. Don't tell anybody what you're doing. Jesus said, when you pray, don't tell everybody, hey, watch me, I'm going to pray now. No, we do these things for the Lord. Are you setting aside your flesh for a time so that you can focus more on God's word, on God's will, on his plans for you? Again, we can fast from a lot of things. You know, fast from your TV for a week or two. The toughest one, fast from your cell phone for a day or two. Oh, no, anything but that. <laughs> Try fa fasting from Fox News for a week. Oh, no, you've gone too far. No. Just spend that time reading the Word, but you can fast from all sorts of things. Jesus does not answer why they were fasting, but he'll answer, because the other part of the question was, how come your, your disciples aren't fasting? That's what they really wanted to know. So he tells them why. Look at verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom, that's Jesus, will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. In other words, he's telling them, you know, you don't go to a wedding and fast and mourn. 
You know, you don't go to a wedding. It's supposed to be a joyful celebration. The groom's there. The bride's there. It's a celebration. You know, what a drag it would be to go to a wedding and everybody there is throwing, you know, dust in the air and wearing sackcloth and ashes and they're all mourning and crying. That would be a horrible wedding to go to. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. As long as Jesus is with us and he's alive, we rejoice and celebrate. And guess what? Jesus is alive and he's with us today. This is why we rejoice. This is why we celebrate. This is why, as new creations in Christ, who've had our sins washed away, and He's preparing a place for us in glory, this is why we should be the most joyful people in the world. Because we know where we're going. We know what the future holds. And so how can we not be filled with joy and excitement and looking forward with great hope and anticipation of what Christ is going to do in the near future? Now, when Jesus says here, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast. He's referring to when Jesus would be arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. He would be beaten. He'd be nailed to the cross the next day. He would die on the cross. He'd be put in the tomb. But it was, again, it was only for the weekend. And then they would rejoice once again after he rose from the dead. Because early that Sunday morning, Jesus would conquer the grave. He'd burst forth you know, from the tomb, and he'd be alive forevermore, and they would all rejoice forevermore. In John 16, he's telling, he tells his disciples you know, that he's going to the cross, he's going to die, and they didn't get it all. And they're like, no. And then they start getting sorrowful because he's like, no, I'm going to die. But this is what he says in John 16, 22. Therefore, you now have sorrow, because they're finally cluing in that he actually is going to go to the cross, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. And so today, if you want to fast, that's great. Again, just make sure you're drawing closer to Jesus. But praise the Lord, He is alive. He's risen from the dead. He dwells in us. He is with us. He's preparing a place for us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. So we rejoice in that fact. doesn't mean it's, life is always fun. Doesn't mean you're always happy. Happy is an emotion. Joy is fruit of the Spirit that can never be taken from you. Well, look at verse 16. Uh, verse 16. He says, No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and the tear is made worse. Nor do they put new wine into old wineskins, or else the wineskins break, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. These two illustrations are speaking of the exact same thing. In other words, you don't sew a brand new patch on an old pair of Levi's. Because when you wash it, then it shrinks up and it'll rip, make the hole worse. Back when I was a kid, I remember I was about 11 years old, and I was one of the cool kids. I had the button-up Levi's. Remember those? Button-up flies? Those. Man, I wish I had some now. Those things are expensive, I guess. They sell for tons of money. So, oh well. Can't go back. <laughs> I used to have those things all the time. And everybody looked. Well, no, I can't go there. Like Looking at your fly like, those don't have a zipper? That is so, so weird. Anyway, that's a whole different topic. I'm sorry. But... So I had a great pair of Levi's. Like, you know, and when you're a kid, 11, 12 years old, you run around, you get holes in them, and your mom would sew on a patch. My mom would buy these iron-on patches. They were like dark, dark blue, and your jeans are fading out. You'd iron it on there, and then you'd look like a dork, and then you'd wash it, and it would shrink, and it'd turn into a little ball on your knee, and then you'd look like a bigger dork. And so I was like, you know what, these, I can't wear these anymore. So I ended up making some cool uh, jean shorts out of them. But anyway, the thing is, it's true for old garments. You don't put a new patch on it because when it washes and dries, it shrinks. And it makes it worse. I can't believe people are actually spending twice as much money for holy shredded pants. Man, you used to do that just plain. Now it's like, oh, I'll spend extra money to get them torn already. Anyway, I'm old. So, but the same thing is true with old wineskins that were made out of leather. Um, 
you know, over time, the, the leather would stretch. It would lose its elasticity. And so when you put new wine in an old stretched out wine skin, as it fermented, it would expand. And well, because it's an old wine skin, it couldn't handle the pressure and it would split open and you just ruin the wine skin. You'd lose the new wine. And so that's what Jesus is referring to here. In context, he's talking about the new covenant that is based on his death, burial, and resurrection. That is the unshrunk cloth. That's the new wineskin. The old garment, the old wineskin, that's the old covenant. Jesus is saying, I'm here to do something new. I'm not here to try to patch up Judaism. There's a new covenant that he has given us. Now, it's interesting, some of the Jew wannabes, I call them Jew wannabes because they're not really Jewish, but they want to be Jewish, which is just weird to me because they want to go back into the old covenant. And somebody gave me this book, and it's all about, there's only one covenant, there's not two covenants. And I'm like, uh, there is pretty clearly two covenants, the Old Testament, the New Testament. Jesus says, you know, this is the blood of the new covenant that's shed for many for the remission or forgiveness of sins. But the point is, Jesus is making, you cannot mix law, the old covenant, with his grace. John 1, 17, look at these verses. It says, for the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In fact, the entire book of Galatians, I don't know why this is so hard for people to figure out. You read the book of Galatians, the whole book of Galatians is to come against those who are trying to make Gentiles like me and you into Jewish people. Because that's what the argument was in Acts 15. Well, how does a Gentile get saved? Well, they got to come under the law of Moses. They got to get circumcised first. Then they can become a Christian. And Peter says, no, it didn't work for us. We couldn't save ourselves under the old covenant. We have to be under the new covenant, where it's by faith alone in Christ alone. So Galatians 2.16, it's already, no, there it is. Knowing that a man, this summarizes all of Galatians, by the way, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So you cannot get saved under the old covenant of I'm going to live my heart, try my hardest to live by the Ten Commandments, and then God's got to accept me. No, He doesn't. Why was the law given? It was to show us that we're sinners. Romans 3, verse 20, it tells us, you know, through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Paul tells us when he's writing to Timothy, the law is good if you use it lawfully. And it's to show us we can't save ourselves. Later on in Galatians, he says, the law is a tutor and an instructor, it brings us to Christ because the law shows me, Jeff, you're a sinner. You've blown this commandment, that commandment. That, you know, you've blown all these commandments. What are you going to do about it? I can't do anything. But it's a tutor, and the law says, good. Here, I'll take you to Jesus. The law is a tutor. It brings us to Christ. Once we come to Christ, Galatians 3, 20-something. <laughs> Read the whole chapter. It's awesome. So... It brings us to Christ, and once you come to Christ, you're no longer under the tutor, it says. You're no longer under the law. So Jesus establishes a whole new system. He wasn't here to fix their religious system, but Jesus came to fulfill, and that's what he says, I came to fulfill the law, fulfill the prophets. He fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law. By the way, only Jesus, the perfect Son of Man, the only begotten Son of God could live up to and fulfill every aspect of the law. So now that we are in Christ, the law is fulfilled in us. I could never do it, but because I'm in Jesus and Jesus fulfilled it all, that's why I'm saved. That's why God sees me as justified, as righteous, not because of anything I could do, but because of what Christ has done for me. He alone fulfilled all the requirements that the law demands. It should come as no surprise that Jesus brought in this new covenant because, again, the Old Testament tells us that God would bring in a new covenant. This book that this person gave me says, there's only one covenant, there's not an old and new, there's only the old covenant, and it's just been, you know, new as part of the old, and it's like, eh. Jeremiah 31, verse 31. 
It says, Behold, and this is when the Jews have been, they're just on the verge of being taken into captivity by the Babylonians. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. This is what God gave to Moses, right? The old covenant when they came out of Egypt. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their hearts, write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is all about a relationship God is establishing with us. It's not about religion. He says, I will do this. So when people say, well, Christians, you think you're, under, you're no longer under the law? It's like, I'm not under the law of Moses to try to live up to it. No, the law is now in me. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables me to live out my life for the Lord. So it's not me, it's Jesus in me working through me. So he goes on to say, I will put my law in their minds, write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. That's the new covenant. Again, Jesus says this new covenant I establish with you, and it's based on my blood shed for you, because all the old covenant laws and all the sacrifices, the bulls, the goats, the sheep, on one Passover, during the time of Christ, Josephus tells us 250,000 lambs were slaughtered on one Passover. And they did that year after year after year. Why? Because the blood of those animals could never remove your sins. They were temporary covering for sin. This is why we read the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews in the New Testament points out why Jesus is superior to the law of Moses, why he's superior to all the sacrifices, because his once and for all sacrifice on the cross obliterates all the old covenant sacrifices. Jesus fulfilled what the law could not fulfill. That's what Hebrews is all about. So the new covenant it is so much superior to the Old Covenant. Now, there are those who wrongly use these words of Jesus to try to justify their so-called new and improved ways of doing church. You know, when he says you can't put new wine into old skins, I've heard people say, well, I found a new way to do church. We don't want to do things like Calvary Chapel. We don't want to teach expository and that's fine. You can teach topical. That doesn't matter. But we don't want to talk about doctrine. Uh, this is where it bugs me a lot. When church, where pastors say, I don't want to talk about doctrine in church. Uh, why not? Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, <laughs> for reproof, for correction, training in righteousness, 2 uh, Timothy 3.16. You don't want to talk about doctrine. Yeah, doctrine divides. We don't want to be a church that divides. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring unity. I came to bring division because truth divides. So we want to you know, talk about doctrine. Oh, we don't want to turn anybody away from you know, the church. So we don't talk about sin. Been in churches like this. We don't want to talk about repentance. Uh, we don't want to talk about being born again. We certainly don't want to have people think that we're weirdos. So we don't want to talk about the rapture. You know, we don't want to talk about the Antichrist that's going to be coming soon. We don't want to be talking about the, uh, the Great Tribulation. No, we don't want to talk about these things or the second coming of Christ. No, no, no. We want everybody to leave the church with a pat on the back, making them feel good about themselves. That's sad to me. And I've disagreed with some of them. And, and they've told me, you know what? Can't put new wine into old skins. That's not what he's talking about. That's so wrong. Jesus is teaching us he didn't come to patch up Judaism, but he came to introduce the world to the gospel of grace, that he alone paid for our sins. His blood alone is sufficient to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that he paid the price in full. There's zero that I can do to earn or merit salvation. And just by the fact that Jesus went to the cross proves to me three things. Number one, we're sinners. 
Because again, Galatians says, if there is a law given that can make you righteous, then Christ died in vain. In other words, if you can make yourself righteous, then Jesus wasted his time coming 2,000 years ago and dying on the cross for you, for your sins. Secondly, we, it proves that we could never save ourselves, let alone wash away even one ounce of sin from our lives. And number three, it proves to us how much God loves us because he sent Jesus to die in our place, to take all the wrath, judgment, the penalty for sin that I deserve, he took it upon himself. Remember Romans 5, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say, oh yeah, he waited for you to get your act together. And then he would come and die in your place. No, he, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And it's only because Jesus rose from the dead and conquered the grave and is alive today that he can offer the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will receive him by faith. And that's the glorious truth of the new covenant, the new wine that Jesus placed in the new wineskins that is his glorious church, his bride, his body. And Jesus has pre uh, preserved that church that he started, that he's building for 2,000 years. This is a church that he says he would build and the gates of hell or Hades would not prevail against it. This is a church that Paul says, and I'm not talking about our church, I'm talking about the church in general, biblical Christianity. Paul says th this church is the pillar and foundation of truth. That's the church that Jesus loves to describe in Acts 2.42 where it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Wow, steadfastly in the doctrine. Wow, that simply means God's word. And fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And again, this is why our home fellowships, our life groups are so important. You really get to encourage, build each other up in the faith. That's the church that Jesus gives the promise to. The church of Philadelphia in the book of Revelation, remember, he says, hey, you have a little strength, you've kept my word, you've not denied my name. And then he says this, Revelation 3.10, because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from, the Greek word from there is E-K, ek, means to take you out of, I'll keep you from, take you out of, notice, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. Translated, the great tribulation. That's the hour of trial coming on the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. So that's his promise to those who are truly his. These are the churches that Paul planted throughout the Roman Empire, and he passed these churches on to men like Timothy and Titus, and Silas and a whole bunch of other men. These are the ones that he says, okay, you've given, Paul says to Timothy, I've given this to you. You give this to others who give it to others on down the line. That's how we are where we are today. It's just going verse by verse through God's word, building people up in the faith. I love what Paul told Timothy just before he was put to death in Rome. 2 Timothy 4, look at these verses, starting in verse 1. Paul says, Again, he's almost he's going to have his head cut off here in about two or three months after he writes this. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. That's first and foremost. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and teaching. And here, take note of this because we're in this time period today. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They don't even want to talk about doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Like, this is your best life now. Just name it and claim it, and you'll be rich. You'll be healthy. You know, there's so many things that, you know, they're, they're fables. They twist God's word, taking one verse out of context and trying to build a doctrine out of it. But you, this is all of us, be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, 
well, that's kind of negative. I don't know if I want to do afflictions. I got a positive Christianity. I listen to Caleb. I listen to Caleb too, but you know, don't follow this as positive, encouraging. Yeah, it's okay, but that's not why you listen to it. It's because you want something positive. Because you have to endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Jesus has preserved his church for the last 2,000 years. Now, obviously, there can be a lot of latitude in the methods when it comes to how you do church. But the message, this is the key, the message cannot change. In other words, music styles for 2,000 years have changed, wouldn't you say? We're not doing the old Gregorian chants anymore, you know? Organs are fine. Pianos are great. I mean, but that's, that doesn't have anything to do with the gospel and the word of God. Those things change. Churches can be formal. You can have a big steeple. That's great. Or, you know, stained glass windows or in an old building like ours. It doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is the word of God should always be proclaimed. Jesus Christ should always be our main focus. And if we're truly walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and not just saying we are, then we're going to look for opportunities to minister to those around us who are hurting, who are struggling, calling them up, see how they're doing, checking it, you know, on people that you know that the Lord's put in your life, and we can bless, encourage, exhort those around us. Where are we? Verse 18. While he spoke these things, talking about the old garment, you don't put a new patch on it, you don't put new wine into old skins. While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him, and so did his disciples. It's in Luke's gospel that we're given some more details about this situation here. This is the ruler of the synagogue. His name is Jairus. His name means God enlightens. Interesting name. It's also in Luke chapter 8, verse 42. We read that this girl, his daughter, is 12 years old, and that she is on her deathbed, and that she is on the brink of death. So when he says, my daughter's just died, it literally means in the Greek, she is about to take her last breath. She hasn't given up the ghost yet, but she's about to die at any moment. No doubt Jairus knew all about Jesus. This is in Capernaum, Capernaum. We already saw that the centurion, remember Jesus healed the centurion's servant, and some of the religious guys were saying, this is a good man. He built our synagogue here in Capernaum. And, and we saw pictures of the foundation of that very synagogue. They're still there in Capernaum. So Jairus is the ruler of that synagogue. So he knows. He's been hearing all about what Jesus is doing. We've seen in my, Matthew's gospel, Jesus had already healed multitudes of people. He's already cast out demons from multitudes of people. This is where he will heal the guy in that synagogue that has the withered hand. And Jesus does it, even though it was a Sabbath day. None of this was done in secret, so everybody knew what Jesus was doing. And no doubt Jairus may have been one of the Jewish religious leaders who was skeptical when Jesus first got into their city, but now he's desperate, and he believes, Jesus is my only hope for my dying daughter. Luke's gospel also tells us that when Jairus came to Jesus, he fell at his feet, he worshipped him, and he begged Jesus to come to his house. As we see here in verse 18, Jairus also said, But come and lay your hand on her and she will live. So again, he is very desperate for Jesus to work in his life. He's a great example of knowing religion cannot help me. Jairus, he realized... My religion cannot do anything for my daughter right now. People in religious systems can find structure. They can find commonality with other people. There's a sense of community. But religion can't save your soul. Religion cannot deliver you from the depths of darkness. Religion can't wash away all of your sins. But Jesus certainly can. And he can make you a new creation. 
Again, Jesus is the new wine that can't be put into the old brittle wineskins of religion. And Jairus, he's finding this out in a hurry. So Jesus and his disciples are following Jairus back to his home. But watch what happens. Verse 20. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Now, it's interesting because this is a really significant miracle, but Matthew kind of just goes through it pretty quickly. Again, Matthew's writing primarily to the Jewish people, and he's out to prove Jesus is their long-awaited Messiah. But Dr. Luke, that's why he was a doctor who wrote the Gospel of Luke, he goes into a little more detail because there's things that Luke brings out that I think are really important in this miracle. Look at these verses in Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 43. This is the same scene, he just gives us more details. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who has spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. So she's broke now. She spent every penny she had, every denarius, every shekel on doctors trying to get better, but she could not be healed by any of them. They couldn't do anything for her. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied it, now Jesus knows who it is, but we'll see how this plays out. When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you. Again, there's just multitudes of people crowding around Jesus. And you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. Why was she trembling? Because she knows she, she, knows she has just broken the law of Moses. Because anybody that had any type of issue of blood, you were considered unclean. If you touched a person, they were unclean. If you sat on somebody's chair, that chair was unclean. They had all these processes to go through to make that chair, to make that person clean. So that's why she's trembling, because she broke the law by touching Jesus. But as we'll see, Jesus cannot be defiled by our uncleanness. All he ever does is remove our uncleanness. He washes our sins away, so he never gets defiled. So she's falling down before him, and she declared to him in the presence of all the people. So now, you know, she's no longer doing this secretly. She's talking to everybody the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. So what a contrast between these two very different, very needy, helpless people. You got Jairus, this religious leader. You got this woman who is just down and out, doesn't have anything left. Jairus knew nothing but joy for 12 years as his daughter was there growing up. But this woman, for 12 years, those same 12 years, knew nothing but pain, isolation, and discouragement. Doctors couldn't help her. She's desperate. Jairus publicly falls down at Jesus' feet, begs him, come with me and touch my daughter. She'll be made well. And here she secretly tries to sneak up behind, just touch the hem of his garment, and then maybe I'll be made well. She was hoping nobody would notice. Again, she was ashamed. She was embarrassed. But again, most of all, she knew she was breaking God's law. That's from Leviticus 15, if you want to read about it. She was not allowed to touch anyone or anything. That's why she's trembling. But here we see her faith in action. If only I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll, I'll be healed. So two very different people who come to Jesus with two very different problems. But nothing's too difficult for Christ. He can do what he wants, how he wants, when he wants. Now, why do the Gospels mention this woman reaching out, only wanting to touch the hem or the border of his garments. 
The Greek word for hem here refers to the tassels that the rabbis would wear on their robes. And they would have these tassels going down the edge of their robes, and they would sew blue thread onto them. And God instructed Moses to do this, to tell the men, the Jewish men, about these robes. And this is what we read, Numbers chapter 15, verses 38 to 40. God tells Moses, speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations. And there's the Orthodox Jews in Israel still do this to the day. Uh, I've run into a few Jewish wannabe guys that are still doing this today, wearing these tassels. That's whatever. But notice, you know, make these tassels on the corners of their garments throughout their generations to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners and you shall have the tassel that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them and that you may not follow the harlotry to which your own heart, your own eyes are inclined and that you may remember and do all, again he says, do them, do all my commandments and be holy for your God. Again, the law of God requires perfection. So you can wear those tassels. It's to remind you to keep every one of the laws that I've given you perfectly. Well, they started thinking, well, yeah, I'll make my tassels even longer. I'll make my borders even wider. And people are going to think, I'm so righteous. I'm so holy. Jesus will call these guys out as hypocrites. Jesus is wearing the robe. He's got the tassels. And she's thinking, if there's ever been a person that has lived by the law of God, that kept the law perfectly, it must be Jesus. She's been seeing and hearing everything he's doing. Nobody can keep the law perfectly. Well, this guy must be. So if I could just touch his garment, he's the only one that's living up to the perfect standards of God's law. Again, it's interesting that Jesus will rebuke the scribes and the Pharisees in chapter 23 because they were enlarging their hems of their garments, making the borders wider, the tassels longer, because they wanted people to go, ooh, look how righteous that Pharisee is. And he rebukes them for their hypocrisy. But Jesus will call them out seven times in Matthew 23 alone. Here it's interesting that when she touched his garments, it says she was healed instantly. Instead of rebuking this poor woman who must have been, think about it, 12 years bleeding constantly. I mean, so anemic, so weak, no money, just down and out. And instead of rebuking her because she broke the law, Jesus blesses her and he calls her daughter. Notice, be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well couple of uh, significant things here. When he says made well, the Greek word is sozo. It means to be made well physically, spiritually, emotionally, always. Made well whole. Your whole being is made well. There's something called the sozo prayer that's going through some circles and churches, and it's not anything to do with this. They take it out of context. They're doing things to try to manipulate God, so beware when you read about the sozo prayer. There's some groups that are doing it. That's not what it's referring to here. Jesus can make you well in His ways, in His timing. Another thing, again, this is the only time Jesus calls someone daughter. He sees her, this broken, down, discouraged, weak, anemic woman. He doesn't say, you're an Israelite. He doesn't see her as even a daughter of Abraham when he says, you are a daughter. He doesn't see her as unclean or isolated. He sees her as a beautiful, precious child of the Lord. I can only imagine, though, here he says, your faith has made you well. And what's Jairus thinking? Well, come on, hurry up, no more delays. I got a daughter that's dying. You got to, come on, that's enough of this. Good, she's better, let's go. So remember how Jesus chose to wait for four days after Lazarus was sick? Remember Martha sends word down to Jesus and the disciples there at the Jordan River and Lazarus was sick. Get here quickly, Jesus, Lazarus is about to die. Again, she hasn't died yet, this girl, 
And Lazarus hadn't died yet, so they think our only hope is Jesus has to get here before he dies. He has to get to my daughter before she dies because they think it's too late. Once she dies, they didn't understand this is Jesus. Death couldn't stop him. He was going to raise this girl, the first one he was going to raise from the dead. So I think he's waiting, and Jairus is freaking out, but he's just allowing this time to pass because remember Lazarus, four days when he finally shows up in the town of Bethany, and they said, only if you'd gotten here sooner, our brother wouldn't have died. But he was waiting for her to, you know, waiting for him to get ripe, <laughs> to be four days dead and buried. So he says, roll away the stone. First he tells Martha, hey, realize I am the resurrection life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Well, yeah, Lord, I believe that you're the Christ, the only begotten Son of God. And so he goes and raises him from the dead. Roll away the stone. Lazarus, come forth. And he's raised from the dead. Amazing. Well, the same thing. He's letting this play out, taking his time. And this is what he's waiting to hear. Luke chapter 8, verse 49. It says, while he was still speaking, while Jesus is still speaking to the woman, and they're talking about stuff, Someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Again, they're thinking too late. She took her last breath. Jesus can't do anything for us now. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Do not be afraid, only believe, and she will be made well. Again, sozo. Look at verse 23. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, these are the professional mourners. As soon as somebody took their last breath, they would come and they would just wail and mourn and cry. It was a big scene. They still do it today. You know, it's just a sign of respect, but just grief as well. So they're just crying and wailing. And he said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping and they ridiculed him. They're like, Jesus, you're nuts. You're stupid. What, what do you mean? We're professionals. We know she's dead. Don't say she's sleeping. Don't give people false hope. But when the crowd was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Mark says, Talitha kumai, little girl, arise. And the report of this went into all the lands. Again, Luke gives us a little more detail. Look at these verses. I'll close with this. Luke chapter 8, verse 51. When he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and mother of the girl. So Jesus and five others are there. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She is not dead, but sleeping. They ridiculed him, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, all these professionals, took her by the hand and called, saying, Little girl, arise. Then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. What is death? Well, physical death is when your spirit leaves your body. Spiritual death, there might be somebody in here. You don't know Jesus is your Lord and Savior. The Bible says you are dead in your trespasses and sins. To be born again, Jesus says, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of heaven. So when Jesus comes into your life, the Holy Spirit brings your spirit that's dead within you to life. That's what it means to be born again. Then you can have a relationship with God. Until then, you're physically alive, spiritually dead. She's physically dead. Her spirit is gone. So now he says, little girl arise, the spirit... Her spirit returned, and she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat, and her parents were astonished. I bet they were. But, here you go, we've seen this a few times, he charged them to tell no one what had happened. That wasn't going to happen. I can guarantee you right now, that wasn't going to happen. How could you not tell everybody what Jesus Christ has done for you? He just raised my daughter from the dead. You going to keep that to yourself? Why was Jesus saying so many times? He says, now don't tell anybody. Remember the legion, the demon-possessed guy? Now don't tell anybody about this. Just go back to your home. Tell them, but don't tell everybody. 
Why? Because he didn't want them to come and take him by force and make him king. But he knew. How are you going to be quiet? You know, I've heard people, Pastor Jeff, I've got this great news. My son, my daughter, they were bound up in this sin. They were delivered. They're set free. They're in this lifestyle that was destroying their life. Now the Lord got a hold of their sin. They can't be quiet about that. How can you and I be quiet? Jesus came into my life. He forgave me of all my sins. I was on a road to destruction and death and Hades, the lake of fire for eternity. Now I'm going to be brought into the kingdom of God when I die? Amazing. We can't be quiet about that. We can't keep to ourselves all the awesome, amazing things Jesus has done for us.